Step 3. Types of errors. In this step, we will look at the various errors that can occur in uh, quantum networks and how to describe them and what effect they have on our qubits. So let's begin. There are generally two classes of errors. The first class is known as operational errors. These include the memory decoherence, the channel decoherence, local gate errors, and the measurement errors. So even when you store your uh, qubit inside a memory and don't manipulate it, the memory itself decoheres, meaning that the qubit loses its quantum properties. This is the memory decoherence. If you send the qubit through a fiber, then the qubit can still undergo some errors. These are the channel decoherence errors. Local gate errors occur when you're trying to manipulate your qubit that's inside your uh, memory. Even if um, you think that uh, you know what you're doing, you're applying some unitary operations, some uh, errors can occur. And these will be either deterministic or non-deterministic, as we will see shortly. And finally, even when you measure your qubits, you can never fully trust the outcomes of those measurements. Sometimes, even when your uh, outcome is zero, this can lead to an error, and in fact, the real outcome should have been a one. The next class of errors is known as loss errors. And this is really due to absorption of photons in the fiber or even in free space. We saw in previous uh, modules and previous lessons that if you send light down uh, uh, optical fiber, some of it will eventually get attenuated. And this is uh, one of the big headaches in quantum networks, because now we are dealing with single photons. And on top of that, you also have coupling inefficiencies. When your source generates a single photon, you have to capture that photon uh, and make it travel along the fiber. And this process is not 100% e uh, efficient, so we have to think about errors associated with coupling inefficiencies as well. And finally, uh, when we are trying to detect the photon with a detector, again, these don't have 100% efficiency. So we have to think about detector inefficiencies. So let's dive into the operational errors. Operational errors can be, for example, coherent. These are deterministic unitary operations, and they can be pictured as incorrect rotations on the block sphere. And in order to determine these errors, we have to perform regular calibration of the hardware. And in principle, these errors are correctable. Once you know what your um, coherent error is, you can always compensate for it. So let's have a look how that would work on an example of a bit flip operation. So let's say that our desired output is the following. We start with a qubit in the zero state and we try to apply the Pauli X operation. This can be pictured as a rotation around the x-axis of the block sphere, and what we get is um, ket1. Pictured on the block sphere is the following. We start at the top over here, in state 0, and we rotate along the surface of the block sphere, and we end up with a state 1. Now, what happens when there's a uh, coherent error? Really what happens is that you don't rotate by the desired angle, but you over-rotate or you under-rotate by some small value here, uh, given by this epsilon over here. So your final output state is not one anymore, but it's some other state. The crucial thing here to note is that even though it's not the ideal state, it's still a pure state. It's represented by a point on the block sphere. Other type of uh, operational errors are incoherent errors. These can be non-deterministic unitary operations, as we will see shortly on an example of Pauli channels, or they can be just non-unitary and also non-Pauli channels, such as the relaxation channel. And these are a lot more difficult to correct, and we have to be a lot more clever in dealing with these type of errors. And in general, they require error correction. So here's our second example of a Pauli X channel. So we start now with a general state rho. It doesn't have to be pure. And we apply the uh, uh, Pauli x channel, represented by this epsilon. And we write it as the following sum of two terms. With probability 1 minus px, we get our input state back, rho. And with some error probability given by px, we apply the Pauli x uh, to our state, given by this term over here. So let's see how it works with an example. We start again with our state uh, zero. 
in the outer product, a representation is given as this, cat0 times bra0. We apply the Pauli X channel. The first term is the term where our state is unaffected with probability 1 minus px. And with probability px, we apply the x channel, which just flips our zeros into ones. So let's see how it uh, looks like with our block sphere representation. This is our starting point, this blue dot over here. We start with state zero. And after we apply the Pauli x channel, we see that the state moves along the z axis towards the center of the sphere. So the crucial thing to note here is that with incoherent errors, we, even if you start with a pure state, generally your output state is a mixed state. But not all states are affected equally by this channel. Let's consider a different example where we don't start with the cat0 state, but we start in a superposition of 0 and 1 given by the plus state, represented by the green arrow on the block sphere. So now we go through the application of the channel again. With probability 1 minus px, nothing happens to the state. And with probability px, we apply the Pauli x operation. But the plus state is a plus one eigenstate of the Pauli x operator. Therefore, it remains unaffected by this Pauli x channel. So, in fact, what we get back is the same state. So we see that um, the state 0 plus 1 is not affected by the Pauli x channel. Let's consider a different example of different starting points on the block sphere. So our channel is still the Pauli x channel, but this time we have a distribution of pure states uh, on the block sphere. So if our probability, error, uh, probability of error is zero, then all the states remain uh, on the block sphere. But now let's increase the probability px to a value, let's say, of 0.2. And what we see is that some of the points move away from the sphere and inside the block sphere, whereas others, like the uh, um, states near um, the plus state and near the minus state on the other side of the block sphere, remain uh, unaffected. If we increase the probability of error even further, we see that all those states get squished even more towards the x-axis on the block sphere. And this is how Pauli x channel can be pictured using the block sphere representation. So let's see what happens when we apply the Pauli y channel. Now we've got the probability of error py, and that we, uh, our state undergoes um, transformation given by the Pauli y matrix. And again, we start with many pure states uh, distributed equally on the block sphere. And what actually happens is that now the zero state and the x st uh, plus state, they also are affected by this noise channel, but the state plus i and the minus, minus i are not. And we keep increasing the uh, probability of error py, and again, uh, the state gets more squished towards the y-axis of the block sphere, given over here. And for completeness, let's consider the Pauli z channel, and maybe you can guess what's going to happen. Again, we start with uh, the, our pure states, and when we apply our um, Pauli z channel, what happens is that the states are getting squeezed along the z-axis. So in this case, the state uh, 0 and the state 1 are unaffected by this channel. Pauli Z, Z channel is quite an important channel and has another name. Um, it's co sometimes called the dephasing channel. Why that is? Let's see. Let's start with a particular pure state given by this superposition. It's a superposition of 0 and 1, but this time we are considering some uh, uh, relative phase given by this angle phi. And let's say that we apply uh, our Pauli Z channel, and let's say that the probability of error is very high, it's one half. And in fact, what we obtain is the, uh, the, following, the following state, um, the maximal, uh, maximally mixed state of zero and one. So we see any information about this relative phase phi has been washed away by the application of this very strong Pauli Z channel. So if we go back to our block sphere representation, all of these states, can be represented as individual dots on the equator of the block sphere in the xy plane. And all of those states, upon application of this strong uh, dephasing, uh, move towards the center of the block sphere. And if you remember, the center of the block sphere represents the maximally mixed state. Now, 
For our fifth example, let's consider the depolarizing channel. The depolarizing channel is particularly important uh, in quantum communications. And here what we do is we assume that we can have X errors, Y errors, and Z errors, and they occur with the same probability. So the correct description is given by this expression over here, where with probability P we apply the X error, probability P we apply the Y error, and same for the Z error. And can you guess what's going to happen to our initial pure states distributed on the surface of the block sphere? Well, this time, none of the states are impervious to uh, this noise. All of them get squished um, towards the center of the block sphere. And you keep increasing the strength of the depolarizing noise, and the ball gets even smaller, and all of them get concentrated towards the center of the block sphere. Now, all of these channels are known as Pauli channels, because all we need to describe them are Pauli uh, matrices. Let's consider a different channel known as the relaxation channel, or sometimes the amplitude damping channel. This time we cannot use the Pauli matrices to describe the channel mathematically. What we need are these Krauss operators, these matrices given by K0 and K1. And they have this particular form. And gamma gives us the strength of the relaxation channel. In other words, it's, um, it's the probability with which um, we apply the channel and how strong its effect is. For example, if gamma is equal to zero, then we see that nothing happens to our state. So how does this look uh, uh, on the block sphere? What we do is, we again, we start with our pure states and all of them get squashed towards the state zero. And it is exactly this fact that all of the states are trying to concentrate towards the pure state zero, why we call it relaxation. It seems like that the state is relaxing towards a particular state. In this case, it's the zero state. So this concludes our discussion of operational errors. Now let's move on to loss errors. Now, rate of communication decreases exponentially with distance. What that means is that if you try to send a photon, um, to a, another node in the quantum network, um, and that node is not too far away, you've got a pretty good chance that it's going to arrive um, uh, and not get absorbed by, by the fiber. But if you keep moving this node further and further and further away, your chance that your photon actually makes the journey all the way decreases exponentially. And it's given by this expression over here. So the important uh, constant here, the important parameter, is the attenuation length. And typically in uh, fib uh, optical fibers, it's of the order of 20 kilometers. But that's not the only error that's affecting our loss errors. We already mentioned the collection error the, or the collection probability. So this is the probability with which a photon that's generated by a single photon source gets captured by the fiber and starts traveling down the fiber towards its destination. And often it's denoted by eta c. And then we also need the detection probability, that actually we can detect the photon, and we denote it by eta d. So the total probability that our photon arrives to its destination and gets detected is given by the product of all these three probabilities. First, we need to successfully collect the photon, then it needs to successfully travel all the way to its destination, and then it needs to be successfully detected. Therefore, we have the expression eta c times p photon times eta d. Now, this concludes our discussion of operational and loss errors. Soon, we will begin to learn how to deal with them.